trial lawyer, author, and media personality, Mike Papantonio, on this edition of Conversations. Mike Papantonio is a well-respected trial lawyer, but if you're a big corporation with questionable ethics and business practices, you're probably not going to invite him to the company picnic. Pap, as he's known to those close to him, has mowed down some major adversaries over the years. From pollution to opioids, Pap Antonio has stood tall against corporate giants who have put profit before people. When he takes a break from trying cases, you might find him writing novels. He's just released his fourth in a series. It's entitled Inhuman Trafficking. We welcome back to Conversations Mike Papantonio. Great to see you again. Good to be here, Jeff. Thank you. Fourth novel here the, that you've written, kind of in a series focused around one particular character there, Deke. This is called Inhuman Trafficking. What's it about? Well, yeah, it's a 40, it's a 42 billion dollar industry. Is the whole human trafficking is a 42 billion dollar industry. And this book takes and takes a look at where is all that money coming from and where is it going. And people think of trafficking, they think it's just one person that maybe has one or two people that he's trafficking and that's so far from the truth. It's it's become a corporate entity. Um, if I think of this book, for example, uh, covers a couple of cases that I'm handling, one being where you've got uh, the trucking industry, mm -hmm. that, that they, they end up trucking girls from L.A. across, say, I-10 to the eastern seaboard, and they, they, they take the 18-wheelers and they break them up into little bedrooms, and then they end up stopping at truck stops, and people come in and have sex with these mostly minors, you know, 14, 15 year old girls, and then they leave. Well, the truck stop knows about it. The truck stop that they're doing business with, it's a chain. Actually, there's a couple of chains involved. I, I don't want to name names right sure. now, but the chains know exactly why they allow this to happen. It brings in business. People have to buy fuel. They have to buy food. They sometimes stay overnight. So it's a business decision to let that happen. Uh, so that, that's one example of what I'm talking about, but it's, it, it, the second part is also corporate. We have corporations that go over to a place like uh, Ukraine. You may remember the case just 10 years ago uh, over in Destin where they had all the Ukraine H-2B workers come in, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then they found out that they would uh, invite them over here how would you like to work as a greeter in the restaurant? Well, they put him in the restaurant and then they say you can make more money if you want to work at a, as a greeter over here at the strip club. And oh, by the way, you can make even more money if you want to get up on the pole and dance as a pole dancer. And this is where it ends. How would you like to meet Tom? Mm -hmm. Tom wants to meet you. And they meet Tom and that's the last we see of them. That happened 40 miles down the road, 50 miles down the road, Destin, Florida, however far it is. And it happened right here, you know. And so this, this, book, <clears throat> this book takes those stories and it, takes, it makes it into a fiction novel, although mm -hmm. it's all true. Mm -hmm. My goal is to show that the corporate media has been typical corporate media. If there's an advertiser involved, they won't tell the story because they don't want to offend the advertiser. Here, you have Wall Street involved. Mm -hmm. Uh, one part of the case is you got a Canadian company that is the central, they centralize most of the pornography that takes place all over the globe. That company ran out of money. They were heavily into child pornography. Wall Street, huge funds came in and kept, propped them up, loaned them somewhere around $700 million so they could stay in business. Actually took an equity interest in that company. Let me tell you quickly what they do they have a Rolodex of traffickers. They'll call a trafficker, say, we need a, we need a scene with a 14-year-old girl being raped in a hotel room. So they call the trafficker, the trafficker pulls into the hotel, buys, he gets a suite, maybe two suites for two weeks. They bring in, because this is their filming time. Mm -hmm. They bring in cameras, they bring in lights. People at the hotel clearly know what's going on. They got little girls running all over the place. and and they, they see that some kind of filming's taking place up in the suite, and they let it happen. You got the hotels that look the other way. You've got this corporation in, in Canada that's being propped up by, by Wall Street. 
Uh, we we want to think that this is just some kind of really isolated problem that's not a problem. It's a huge problem. I just hired a lawyer um, who was trafficked when she was 14 years old. She got out of trafficking, went to went made her way to UCLA, got an MBA, got a JD, and has works for, works for us now. She lived in trafficking for four years. How, how, how do young ladies get into this? How, 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 how are they seduced into it? It's a whole series of problems, okay? Sometimes we, we want to believe, well, they just came from broken homes. We want to say they're foster care children. We want to say they're, they're just intrinsically, they've got psychological problems and they end up going there. They got drug problems and they end up going there. But that's not true. It could be your neighbor. Uh, this girl that I'm talking about was upper middle class. And she got pulled into it with what they call the Romeo routine. And the Romeo routine is very complex. They've worked, it's, it's taken a lot of time for them to work it out, but it works. If you want to hear about it, I'll be glad to tell you. Please do. It's as simple as they, they, they take a good looking guy, a good looking girl, <clears throat> put him at the bar, okay? They meet some girl, they say, how would you like to go to our party? They don't look suspect, they don't act suspect because they're fairly refined. They know the deal. They know exactly how to pull it off. They take that girl to a party and we never see her again. Happened down here in Perdido last year. So the problem is that we don't understand it because corporate media has done a terrible job telling the story. The second thing about it is the Department of Justice may as well be totally, utterly useless because they won't take it on. And why is that? Well, I, I think it's because it, they, they, with the Department of Justice that we've seen over the last 20 years, if it's not low-hanging fruit, they won't prosecute. Mm -hmm. I remember having so much hope for Eric Holder when he came into office under Obama. I said, maybe this is guy's going to do something. He did just the opposite. He let more white-collar criminals get away than anybody I've ever seen. That's what's happening here. If, they, if it's not low-hanging mm -hmm. fruit, the Department of Justice doesn't go after it. Mike, when, when, when you're talking about what's going on, like for example, in the hotel rooms, obviously with young women and camera crews and all that, mm. why doesn't someone inside that hotel notify law enforcement or do they? And no, yeah, that's the problem, they don't. <clears throat> why do you think? Because it's business, Jeff, it's business. And these are big chains that understand it's business. I could name, I, I wish I could name them right here. Sure, you'll sure. take a look at the lawsuit, you'll see who they are. Right. But we gotta, I, I don't, I don't I, I'm going to show that there is a pattern that they have in place and some of these hotel rooms have figured it out. Some of these hotel chains, they have standards that they've written up and they tell their people you got to follow these standards, but it's all lip service. Right. It's just like the Atlanta airport. If you go into Atlanta airport right now, they'll have signs about trafficking. If you suspect this or suspect that, you know why that is? Why is that? They used, to, they used to take girls to Atlanta, put them in a hotel there, right? Right there on the, right there on the facility, right, right there on the airport. They would say, I've got, I've got seven, eight, uh, 14 and 15 year old girls come here. They fly them in, people flying in from Europe, South America, all over the country to have an afternoon to have sex with those girls. And then they fly home. So it was a central hub for, for uh, it still is. It still is, but it's a, simple, it's a central hub for, for trafficking. The only reason they put those signs up is they knew we were looking at them. They knew that people like me uh, understood that the airport industry understood exactly what was going on in Atlanta. How did you first become aware that this problem was so prevalent? Well, I mean, we get calls. We got calls from people and they, they the first call we go, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't think we'll pay attention to that. But by the time you get third or fourth call, you just start saying there's something to all this and let's take a look at it. Kim Adams, who is with my office, is really the person who's most responsible for putting us where we are. She's a brilliant, she is a brilliant trial lawyer. She grabbed a hold of this and has not let go. Most law firms would look at this and they said, this is just too big, we can't do it. But you know, we big is our brand. I mean, tobacco, opioids, I think we've handled uh, 40 of the largest pharmaceutical cases in the country. We've handled uh, 12 of the biggest environmental cases in the country. So big doesn't bother us, but it takes somebody like Kim Adams to look at it and say, I got a heart for this and I'm gonna stay with it. She has a wonderful relationship 
not only with the women, with our clients, but she has a wonderful relationship with, with a lot of support groups all over the country who understand if we succeed here, we can accomplish something. Now you are, you're going after them civilly with the idea that also, I guess somewhere along the way, criminal will come into play I as well? I never have, I, look, I'd love to say that that's true, <clears throat> but I have so little confidence in law enforcement at the DOJ level. We have sent them, uh, in the opioid case, that we, we did all the work on that. We did the discovery and all the work on it. And we send, if we send them a package and say, look, here it is, go prosecute somebody. They won't do it, Jeff, because that person that we're asking them to prosecute has an MBA from Harvard or Yale. They're dressed up like you. They look nice. They don't look like a criminal. Right. They have a Rolex watch on. They've got a Bentley in the parking lot. So we look at them differently. Right. We don't think that they're the person that's problem. And if we, if we contrast that with a, a, a child out selling marijuana on a street corner, that gets caught three, four times, they're going to prison for life. Right, These right. people kill people by the thousands and right. we won't prosecute them because they're, they're just, they have a special exception, you right. see. They're educated, they have a degree from a college and they don't look like criminals. You wrote this book, as, as you said, as, as fiction and, and, and with characters and, and a story and to, to keep it interesting as opposed to the news media. Why do that versus just a, a straight, you know, nonfiction mm. book, I guess? Yeah, question. there's a real good reason for it. I, my, my goal when I first started writing these books all the way back to Law and Disorder and mm -hmm. Law and Vengeance, um, uh, Law and Addiction, mm -hmm. Is I, I understand something about the media, and the media is if you, even if you get them interested, it's got a shelf life of about 24 hours, right? Mm -hmm. So it makes a lot more sense to, to a give them a book where they're entertained. Mm -hmm. It's a good story. They want to know how is this going to end? What happens to this character? Are they going to be okay? And they you know can read a book like this at the beach on a weekend, and you close the book, and you you come away and you've learned something that uh, other people have never told you about. It's stuff you've never heard of before, and it's fact. Mm -hmm. And so the, the idea is to be able to merge both of those things, entertain people, and at the same thing, by the way, you might want to know this. This is a fact that we think is important, and you want to pay attention to it. Well, for example, in the, in the Law and Addiction book that mm -hmm. you wrote and, and I read, and it was amazing to me. I mean, I learned an awful lot from that, and what was kind of amazing to me is as time went by, a lot of that information did start to come out after the fact, yeah. but you know, after some of the lawsuits. Yeah. Which brings me to the next question: Where where are you on that as far as the opioid settlements? We're are close. I mean, we're uh, the first phase of it. Uh, we've negotiated Peter Mouget with our office and Troy and myself and a whole team of us have been working on this. But we've asked Peter to try to get it finalized. But. $26 billion is what they have on the table, and we've accepted it, but we have to then get cities and counties to accept it, and I, I think we're gonna do that. Mm -hmm. It's a fair settlement. Uh, it's only the first part of it, though. There's, there's two other parts, actually three other parts. So we gotta get past this first part right. where we start paying attention to two and three. Right, right. And so, but, but definitely progress had been, has oh, been made. Oh, huge progress. Yeah. Jeff, yeah. when I first started this case, I, it started in, uh, it actually started in Las Vegas at a program that I put on. It's called Mass MTMP. It's right. one of the biggest lawyer programs in America. Uh, we do it twice a year. Ma mass torts, right? Mass torts, yeah. And, and so it started there, just like this, this human mm -hmm. trafficking has started there. But what we do is we launch there. Now, when we first tried to launch it, we had huge resistance. You can't do that, it's not gonna work. You can't, these distributors, you can't sue the distributors, you gotta sue, it was just, a, it was chaos. Mm -hmm. And so the trick to anything this big is to take that chaos and bring some semblance of order to it. Tobacco was the same way, you know, it's sometimes things seem so big. And I think what we've tried to do with our law firm is we've tried to distinguish ourselves and say, look, big is okay with us. Mm -hmm. We do big, mm -hmm. <laughs> <You> <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. We, we do big. <laughs> and you know, people handling auto cases and comp, and that's important. I mean, people gotta be represented, but we, we have a different a approach to it at our firm. And it is to say, what are the legacy cases? Right. Um, my daughter's practicing law with me now. I remember when she was uh, 10 years old, she said, Dad, what do you do? You know, <laughs> you're, tra you're traveling all over the country and you're right. trying cases. And, but she says, what do you do? 
And I, I was proud to be able to say, well, I, I clean up ecosystems, you know? Right. I get bad drugs off the market. Uh, I, I, I do things, I, I help mom and pop who've lost their pension programs because of unscrupulous Wall Streeters. That's what I do. And uh, not to say I'd been just as proud, I guess, to say uh, I, I handle auto cases, but that's not what I do. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? Right. It's just not what I do. Well, you're trying to make a meaningful change, and, and clearly you and your firm have over the years, like you say, from tobacco to op yeah. opioids yeah, and, 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 and so on. You also have had a, a pretty uh, thriving media career over the years, and so over the years, <laughs> and, 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 and as a pundit, it's, and also yeah. you're, you're you're doing something called America's Lawyer. As you're What's talking about all this, it makes me tired. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I, I feel tired between books and practice. Yeah, well, so, yeah I, I started out as you might know. Matter of fact, right here in this studio, we used to do MSNBC from here, right? Right. right. And I was a contributor. Right. <clears throat> I'd be called in to, to give analysis, legal analysis on various things. So I started with MSNBC and then did a little bit of CNN, not much. Uh, and then I was also, I was also a commentator for Fox News. Okay. They'd put a bunch of people on the other side of me to argue with me. <laughs> <laughs> I gave that up because I'd get home and my wife would say, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> Why are you doing that? Because <laughs> it was it was just such a such a, a conflict situation, right. and she said you got enough conflict in your life without doing. That. <laughs> with that. And so now I'm doing America's Lawyer. And, and what is that program about? That is a, it's a, America's Lawyers on Russian television, and the way I got involved with it is because they used to they used to watch me on uh, on TV, and they needed somebody to do legal commentary, and a fellow named Ed Schultz who I used to work with a lot, Big Red, wonderful man, has yeah. since passed away. He's passed away a while back. But I used to do shows with him, and they, they just called me and they said, how would you like to do this, this legal show? And I said, sure. The reason I like doing America's Lawyer uh, is because I don't have any advertisers to worry about. There were so many times when I did MSNBC, I'd be trying to tell a story, and they'd interrupt the story because they thought I was offending the advertiser. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would be in, in a short count, 10, 9, 8, 7, I'd get to 7 and they'd say, Pap, we have to change the story because uh, Bear Corporation called and they know you're doing this story and we have to kill the story. I don't have that problem with America's lawyer. Mm -hmm. I, I have never gotten a call from Putin or anybody <laughs> in Moscow and said, hey, we can't do that story. Right. So. I, that's what I, I guess that's what I like about it, you know? That's the, what I think freedom. is so important. What's, what's next on your agenda? I mean, this, I understand this is a big undertaking as you, as yeah. you know, but what well, else is on your radar, so to speak? Yeah, the, well, the next book I'm working on is, is a book called Law and Terror. And it's about, it's about uh, the big banks washing money for terrorists. Mm. You might remember HSBC got fined $1.6 billion for taking money from terrorists washing it in, 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 in the end under Eric Holder, rather than Eric Holder prosecuting them, he let them sign a document. You know what the document said? It said, yes, we are washing money. Yes, we know it's costing American lives because of what we're doing. Yes, we made, we made uh, I forgot how many billion dollars, 10, 15 billion dollars. And so, and then they made him pay a $1.6 billion. It's, it's cost of doing business. Right. Nobody was. Nobody went to jail. I mean, he the, in the document HSBC had to admit that American lives were lost. Contractors and soldiers, their lives were lost, and that was okay. So that's that's a book that's coming out. It's a big case. A young lawyer with our firm, Chris Polis, who again is a very talented lawyer. He's committed to trying to see this thing through. And so he's the one also handling the, the shooting case, the terrorist shooting case that took at, place at NAS. At Naval Air Station, Pensacola. So we're, we're into the terrorist cases now. Um, we're, we're taking a real look at where did the money come from. Mm -hmm. And it comes from a lot of different sources. We like to think it just comes from places like Iran and, you know, uh, some, of the, some of the enemies of the state, but it doesn't. You guys are really kind of turning over some interesting ground. I mean, almost almost like from a approaching it from a criminal type standpoint, aren't you? Well, yeah, we have to. I, I don't think there's any case that I've looked at in anything I've described to you where I haven't said this really is a criminal case. Right. 
So I, I have to talk myself into, first of all, accepting it's a criminal case and nothing's going to be done about it because these are white-collar criminals and we, we let them go. We have a double standard. So I treat everything like a criminal case because it's always criminal conduct. The criminal conduct in this case that I talk about in inhuman trafficking, it's about as criminal as it can be. But nobody goes to jail, you see. Now, no, not nobody goes. The, the one guy out there that's operating by himself that might have trafficked two girls, he, he may go to prison. But what about Wall Street, who's enabled all this to happen, you see? Yeah. Nothing happens without their money. So, so what was your thoughts on the whole thing with Epstein, Jeffrey Epstein? and, and Well, the, the whole Epstein story tells, tells you a lot, doesn't it? It does. It tells you hubris is alive and well in this country. And it tells you that people who believe they're above the law really are above the law if you look at the names that were implicated in that. And it tells you that we have a culture that seems accepting of that. Because right now, the only person that's really under the gun is Maxwell, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the names they had there. Everything, everybody from Bill Clinton to, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think Trump was actually implicated, right. but, but you, all these names, like Bill Clinton flew on an airplane back and forth to, uh, to the islands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we got to look further, don't we? And it's not just Bill Clinton, it's all these people that believe that they're above the law, that they can do something that nobody can do because they have money, because they have influence. And as a matter of fact, the Epstein case is a great example of the media See, the media was so caught up in the celebrity of that, Jeff. You know, the, 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 the media loves celebrity. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the celebrity was, was, a, was a psychopath. The celebrity, Epstein, was a psychopath. And he was ex they were accepting of him because of that celebrity status. And it, it's, just, it, it's the same thing that's driven out of Hollywood right now. And, you know, we have celebrities all the time giving their opinion about politics, this and that. And why, what's that about? Right, right. See, what, how, how is that becoming even significant to right, us right. that some celebrity uh, or, you know, thinks this is important? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so, somehow we've become as a society obsessed with uh, the celebrity. Oh, haven't we? <laughs> haven't. <laughs> to where we let them, go, we let them get yeah, away with yeah. criminal conduct. Yeah, and, and, and the crazy thing is it, it appears to me you don't even necessarily have to have talent to be considered a celebrity no, anymore. <laughs> you <laughs> don't. You, yeah. just, you so, have to have a site on the web and... You, what is it? What are they called? Influencers? Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is um, that's a whole other story that is quite, yeah. quite frightening. Actually, I have the book that I'm writing on, that I'm working on right now. I have a really good chapter about the influencers. Interesting. You'll get a kick out of it. I want to know, and and I, I don't have a whole lot of time left, but I I, I think that it, it's my understanding too. You're starting to sniff around a little bit as far as the chemical industry is concerned and some agricultural yeah, chemicals. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I've been asked to get involved in the Paraquat case because I handled that big chemical case up in the Ohio River Valley. It was C8, which is oh by the way, if you're watching this program, it's probably in your water because this area is just is covered with C8, drinking water. ECUA won't do anything, uh, but they have, the, the ECUA now understands how serious this is. They now understand that we gotta do something. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, so the chemical industry has gotten away with a lot of things for a long time because we've always, in the law there was something called risk benefit and, and you had a fellow named Posner who was an important judge 15 years ago, and he said, we're going to forgive a lot of things the chemical industry does because of what, it, what we benefit from. Well, he, here's what happened. Roundup's a great example. We let Roundup go crazy across the globe, killed thousands of people with an ugly cancer. Paraquat that I'm working on right now is killing people with Parkinson's disease. I mean, what a horrible death. They have known about it since they first started making the product. But we allow them to do business anyway because they said, well, we got a food shortage and we, got, we need Paraquat. No, we don't. You realize Joe Biden just signed a bill that allows Paraquat to be dropped out of the sky that they can do, they can, they can use air, uh, air delivery for Paraquat. This stuff is so dangerous, three drops will kill you. Yeah, and, and for people that don't know, it's a herbicide, it's a weed it's, killer. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's pretty, pretty frightening stuff. 
Well, what else uh, do you have on the agenda? It, it, not like that's not enough, but <laughs> <laughs> anything else we need to be looking out for well, and working on a new Well, well I mean, there's so, there's so many things kicking around out there, and they're all based. There's so many. The numbers of new cases that are coming out right now are, are just amazing because we have just looked the other way. Regulatory is dead and dying, mm -hmm. okay? Regulatory, we used to believe we had an FDA, an SEC, uh, uh, EPA that worked. Now it doesn't work anymore because they, they're captured by industry. The reason you have so many bad drugs out there right now is because some cat working for the FDA is making, maybe making $100,000 a year and you know, so Pfizer comes to them or Johnson & Johnson comes to them and says, you know, we really need to break. You need to help us on these clinicals. Yeah, they weren't perfect, but we need to, we need to break on this to get this product out on the market. Well, and oh, by the way, Joe, if you do that for us, uh, we're going to give you a job when you get done here. So it's, we, we don't have regulatory oversight. We don't have media oversight because the corporate media has become, become infotainment. What we're doing here, the kind of show you do all the time, that's, that's not the norm. Right. Infotainment, uh, what, what's Kim Kardashian going to wear to the next celebrity event? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of new things developing. Mike Papantonio, he doesn't pull any punches. Doesn't really seem to matter if you're Democrat, Republican, or whatever. <laughs> you just always enjoy having you. We have, you know, you're cranking out this series of books, and this is your fourth one. We'll look forward to the fifth one. It's called Inhuman Trafficking, a legal th uh, thriller. And uh, also, I'll give Alan, Alan Russell a mention. Who was, oh, yeah, uh, also. wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful edit. You can see more about Mike and his books at MikePapantonio.com. Thanks, my friend. Appreciate well, thank it. thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. You bet. By the way, you can find this interview along with some of our other interviews with Mike and many other conversations online at WSRE.org slash conversations as well as on YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. Take wonderful care of yourself. We'll see you soon.